I don't think I'm really an academic. And that's, um, that's not just my imposter syndrome coming out. That comes out in all sorts of other ways. It's because I'm a sort of three-legged creature with uh, a foot in each of policy, practice, and research. And that's quite an uncomfortable way to live one's life. But it, I think, gives one a slightly different perspective from people who have uh, only have both their feet in one of those camps. Um, uh, in a previous job, I set up and was director of something called the National Obesity Observatory. And I started that job really naively thinking that all we had to do was pull together all the data and evidence on obesity, package it up into nice, neat little packages, and we got a three-year work plan covering all the different domains we could cover, send it off to policymakers and practitioners in um, language that would make sense to them, and job done. You know, there's a kind of incidence prevalence problem, but we could sort the prevalence and then just deal with the trickle of, of new stuff coming through. How wrong I was. And it took me a while, but not all that long, to realize that there's a fundamental problem with that kind of approach to a problem like obesity and all kinds of other messy, uh, complex public health problems. Because when you look at an evidence base for a messy, complex problem like obesity and value that evidence base on a, a traditional hierarchy of evidence, what you can end up with is getting pushed into doing some of the things that you perhaps shouldn't be doing rather than other things. There are opportunity costs to where it pushes your focus. And um, sometimes, and we've heard a little bit about this so far, um, sometimes it can actually make things worse because it can push you to do things that end up widening inequalities. So I came up with this idea of something called the uh, dangerous olive of evidence. <laughs> it's actually just a Venn diagram, but I was at a conference in Portugal with the most fantastic bowl of olives in front of me, so it's an olive. And if I gave all of you a piece of paper and said, write down your top five, ten really good ideas for what would make a difference to obesity or physical activity or young people's mental health, whatever it might be, that's what sits in the flesh of this big, fat, fleshy, juicy, delicious olive. <laughs> Lots of really good ideas. And then we pull them all together and we do some systematic reviews and what we find is that some of them have actually been researched and evaluated and we've got an evidence base on a bit of what you've all suggested and that's what sits in the pepper that this olive is stuffed with because that's the subset of interventions for which we have some evidence of effectiveness. And the pepper is then stuffed with a really quite small piece of garlic which is the subset of those interventions for which we also have evidence of cost effectiveness. Now, I don't know about you guys from the other side of the Atlantic, but in this country, we don't have a lot of money in the system. And uh, it's quite hard to justify doing things that are not demonstrably cost-effective. How on earth could you justify it? But that's where the olive is dangerous, because the kinds of things that sit within the pepper and the garlic tend to be particular kinds of things. They tend to be the sorts of things that you can test easily. You can test easily within a three, maybe five year research project with 300 people in an intervention arm, 300 people in a control arm, uh, and a measurable effect with a, de uh, a decent effect size. It, Martin talked earlier about um, the Jeffrey Rose approach, that you have a high risk or a population approach. Much of our evidence structurally is driven towards looking at the kinds of things that deal with the high risk approach because it's much harder to look at unmeasurably small changes in large numbers of people over unfeasibly long periods of time within our current research structures. It's doable, absolutely it's doable, there are some fantastic examples of it, but in general, it's harder to do. It's harder to get a grant to do those kinds of things. And I suppose what I want to argue is that uh, one of the things that gets in the way of that and one of the opportunities to deal with it is to look at some of the barriers to upstream research into big, messy, complex things. Now, I can't do three hours. I've got about four minutes left. Um, I thought I'd concentrate on two different things. One is the difference between things that are complicated and complex, and I'll start with that. Saturn V rocket is extremely complicated. There are many, many, many parts in this, but we know that it's possible to build one and send someone to the moon. So if we had all the bits and the right tools, um, what's the nearest square? Bedford Square? Something like that? Um, Tavistock Square. We could clear a space in the middle of Tavistock Square, uh, build one of these. What day are we? Thursday. Let's give ourselves till next weekend. Next Friday, 25th of uh, January. Uh, we'll launch it. We'll get three volunteers. 
put you in that little cone up at the top, three very brave people, and um, up there, we'll send you to the moon. And I think a moonshot takes about five days. So five days later, we will know exactly, to within a couple of hundred metres and a couple of minutes, where to pick you up from in the Thames when you drop back down. Significantly more precision than collecting my 15-year-old daughter from a disco. <laughs> it's very, very complicated, but it is manageable. It's controllable and it's predictable. And often our minds apply this kind of thinking to the ways in which interventions work. Raising a child, however, and turning those people on the left, well, I, you know, I can't claim that I've turned them into it, turning themselves into the people on the right, is a very different category of challenge. And however much people like Dr. Spock or Gina Ford or any other child care, anyone with kids who's listened to these people who say, leave your child to scream endlessly. Never let your child scream. Pick it up and, and, and cuddle it. There is endless conflicting advice at all stages. There's no one thing you can do. There's not a single trajectory or path you can follow. That yellow arrow is wrong. It's a different category of challenge. The other thing I want very briefly to talk about is adaptation, because the ways in which interventions act, not just complex interventions, but actually sometimes quite simple interventions, but within the complexity of a social context, the ways in which that social context, the system adapts to that intervention, can change the way it functions. And that can be a real problem when you're trying to unpick causation. It could be quite a difficult problem. So I'm involved, Martin's leading it uh, in the uh, evaluation of the sugar drinks industry levy, the sugar tax we have in this country. And a simple logic model for the operation of a sugar tax might look like this. Pretty straightforward. Um, I would argue that if this is the logic model you follow, the only evidence you actually need is for that arrow there, which is the price elasticity of demand of sugar sweetened drinks, which is such that as for almost all goods, except some luxury goods people want to show off about, if you put up the price, people buy less of it. That's the case for sugar-sweetened drinks. So if you put up the price of sugar-sweetened drinks, purchasing goes down, it seems reasonable to assume that the other steps follow. But of course it's not that simple, because the system adapts. All sorts of other things happen along the way. As we've heard from Martin, before the tax gets put into place, you get a clamour from industry trying to reduce the, uh, the intensity of the intervention, trying to reduce the tax levels. Uh, one of the really positive impacts we've seen, it was absolutely an intended consequence, is this one, reformulation. We have two thresholds, five and eight grams of sugar per 100 ml of, uh, of drink, and there's been a massive level of reformulation by industry, even before the tax came into place. So the Treasury was, I think, expecting 500, 550 million pounds a year of income from this tax. They're looking to get about half of that because industry has adapted by reformulating its products to get below the tax threshold. We've seen uh, attacks on those of us uh, in the media, on those of us in the evaluation team, to try and undermine whatever comes out at the other end. Industry changes its pricing structures. Retailers put things in promotions in their shops. All sorts of things happen that mean that every step along the way gets attenuated. And it seems to me extremely unlikely that we would be able in any way to detect a direct link between introducing the sugar sweetened drinks tax and the distal outcome of obesity. So what we've done in the evaluation is we've moved beyond this kind of simple linear logic model to map out what the system might look like. You've still got that logic model sort of coming through here. But we've also got other things, as Martin said. Uh, uh, employment. Industry told us before the tax came in, this is going to decimate jobs in the industry. We're going to lose loads of jobs. It's going to be a huge problem. OK, let's look at it in the evaluation. I'm personally really interested in this bit down here, public, political, and media discourse around sugar and sugar-sweetened drinks. It seems to me that uh, potentially one of the imp really, really important impacts of this intervention it's not what it does to consumption of sugar-sweetened drinks nearly so much as what it does to uh, public and political acceptability of fiscal interventions in the food, food system to uh, 
uh, on the basis of internalizing the health externalities of unhealthy foods. So I would never talk about the sugar sweetened drinks tax as a sin tax. I don't think there's a moral dimension to it. I think here's a product that causes health externalities. Let's have an, a level economic playing field such that those health externalities are internalized in the price and see what that does. Because then what you might find is that you're not de facto subsidizing unhealthy foods. You might create a level economic playing field with healthy foods. If I run a corner shop, I would want to sell chocolate, not fruit, because it lasts much longer on the shelves, there's a bigger profit margin, it doesn't get damaged when people pick it up, and so on and so forth. But, but maybe that's partly because the pricing signals are wrong. So let's see how this intervention has a wider effect on the system of changing the political acceptability of this kind of intervention, uh, of measure. <coughs> So very briefly, there's, um, there's a set of key points or conclusions, and um, I haven't had time to, uh, to tease it out fully, but uh, I suppose my central point is that if you think about what's making the olive dangerous, why the things in the pepper and garlic tend to be the individual level downstream things, when the big picture upstream things are potentially more important, then complex systems thinking, these kinds of approaches that look at the system, think about adaptation, and so on and so forth, are potentially really helpful tools to make more sense of things that are currently quite hard to make sense of. Thank you. <laughs>